of our pastor's mouth. In Jesus' name, the church said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give God another good hand this morning. Amen. It's exciting to be in God's house. Aren't you glad to be in God's house? I'd rather be here than any other place this morning. Amen? God's good. Guess what? I am not going to be preaching on the renewing of the mind. I've been teaching a lot about the renewing of the mind all the last couple of weeks. Amen? Today I want to talk about being thankful. We need to be thankful. Amen? We need to learn how to give thanks. We talk about thanksgiving, but you know what? We need to learn how we need to give thanks because God's given us so much. We've got a lot to be thankful for. Look at your spouse and look them in the eye and just say, I'm so thankful for you. Come on, man. Look over there and just say, I am so thankful. Where's my wife at? I am so thankful for that fine woman God gave me. Amen? I'm saying all those things. I'm buttering up. We've got a week to be together all week. Amen? It's going to be exciting. Man, I might just leave right now. Let's just close and go. Y'all have the gumbo and we're on our way. Got a lot to be thankful for. Amen? I want us to just take a moment. We're going to look at some scripture here. I'm going to read a passage of scripture when you're going to go somewhere with it. But it's a great passage here. And it's really talking about these 10 guys who had leprosy. And it's a great story because when you really understand, you know, what he's talking about here, there's 10 of them that he heals and only one of them come back to give thanks. And it really breaks my heart because I would like to believe that I would be the one who went back to give thanks. Would you like to believe that also for yourself? Leprosy was really a bad deal. Now, for those who do not know, let me give you a quick story about or maybe a history lesson on leprosy. But there's two colonies still in, America, still in the world today. And they're located, one of them located right here in South Louisiana over by Carville. It's actually a leprosy colony if you've never seen it before. Uh, I remember as a boy going there on a field trip, and as a boy, we used to go out. They had a big pond. They had a golf course. You can go play golf out there. But it was a colony where they kept all the people who had leprosy in the same location. They kept it arrested. They you really contained it. And that's how they really controlled leprosy. And they have a colony still right there in South Louisiana. And there's only have a handful of people even left there because over the years, it just began to go away. They also have one, I think, in Hawaii. But leprosy, when you were, when you were dealt leprosy, it was like having a death sentence. When you were told you had leprosy, you were just like, you were going to die. Because, I mean, that's what leprosy was. And I was reading about it, and somebody was trying to compare leprosy actually to if someone has AIDS. You know, AIDS really don't have anything, no, no real cure for AIDS. Just like they had no cure for leprosy, you know. Now, leprosy also, one of the things that's kind of interesting, as a boy, if we caught armadillos, they would allow to go, and they would give us like... I'm trying to remember what they paid us back in the day. Like $11 for every armadillo we would bring them alive because they could actually take the armadillos and put leprosy in the armadillos and they would kind of, I guess, experiment on armadillos. Amen? So if you ever catch an armadillo, don't let it bite you. You never know if it has leprosy or not. Amen? But leprosy was really a bad deal. It was really a death sentence, like I said. And actually, even during this time, if someone had leprosy, it was really seen as they were living in sin. They had sin in their life. And so it was really, really bad. I mean, they had to get to the point where if you had leprosy, you really had to humble yourself because you had to depend on everybody else because you couldn't work. They wouldn't allow you to have a job, you know, and you had to really, hopefully somebody would give you food or take care of you or whatever the case may be. So it was real humble. It was a real tough, tough experience. But these guys had, there was 10 guys and they had leprosy. And let me pick up here in Luke 17. Now what's interesting too is when you start looking at the scripture, Luke is the only one who talks about this story. We pick up here in chapter 17, verse 11. It says, Now it happened, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now Jesus is going through here, okay? Then as he entered a certain village, they met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now they lifted up their voice because they really couldn't come close to him. Matter of fact, if they came close to you, they would have to say, unclean, unclean, unclean. And a lot of times when they said that, people would back way away from them. So now these guys are hollering. They were saying, have mercy on us, Jesus. Have mercy. They're hollering across there. And when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourself to the priest. Now this was really protocol for this time. It was a religious thing. Because the priest was the one who determined if you had leprosy or not. 
The priest says, yep, you're a leper, you have to get away from somebody else. And also, if you were not, if you were healed and you didn't have leprosy, you had to go and show yourself to the priest to free you up to go do the things you need to do. They would put their stamp of approval on you, so to speak. And so it was, that as, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, his name was Bobby. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would like to believe it's me, amen. I want to be the one to go back and say thank you, because it's, like I said, this is a death sentence. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. We need to be givers of thanks, amen? And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleanse? Can you imagine the broken heart he had right here? But were there, where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. God, as you birth this message in my heart, God, I pray that I go in the direction. God, I say what you want me to say and do only what you want me to do. Now, Father... I lift up every man, woman, and child in this place, all the kids in Children's Church, all the ones working so hard out there preparing the food. God, I lift every woman and child, man in this place. And God, I thank you that you're going to touch their hearts. And by the Holy Spirit, begin to direct my tongue. And Holy Spirit, we release you into this place. Holy Spirit, you're the one who leads and guides us to all truth. So we ask you now to lead and to guide us into all truth. Touch the heart of everyone in this room. We honor you. We worship you. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we as a body of Christ need to learn to give thanks. Be thankful. Now, one of the things I learned about people that are not thankful, really a person that's not a thankful person, it really shows a level of immaturity. Because a person that's immature is not one to really be thankful about what they have. Because, you know, your kids, you do a lot for your kids. I mean, even a kid or an infant or whatever, you do a lot for your kids or your babies, and they're really not one to say thanks. Your kids are not really thankful. They don't really understand, really, what their parents do because it's a level of immaturity that they have, so they're not able to give thanks. I don't want to have a level of immaturity. I want to be one that gives thanks to the Father. Amen? So you see it real quick that they don't appreciate it. Because, see, kids really don't care about what happened yesterday. They don't care about the future. They don't care about all. They care about what's going on in their life right now. Now, personally, we need to be careful that that's not how we are. Amen? We need to care about the future. We need to care about the things of God. Now, what I saw here was the word thanks comes from an old German word, which means thangle, which means to think. So when you're thankful, you have to think about being thankful. Amen? Yeah. It's something you think about. Now, here's what I want to talk about for a couple moments here. We learn to be more thankful when we stop and wake up and realize where we were before we met Christ. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but that's when I really get thankful. Because I realize if, I'd have met, if I would have never met Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be where I am today. As much as I love my wife, I don't think if we didn't have Christ in our marriage, we couldn't have stayed married. Come on. True. Marriage is tough by itself. But when Christ is in the center of it, it shows you how to love and to be loved and to care and to do the things that you need to do. And so, listen, I am so thankful. We learn to give thanks when we really stop and learn about where we would be without Jesus or where we came from before we met Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, again, we talk about all these things, how the, these lepers, they were abandoned, and all of a sudden, one of them cried out, give me mercy, give mercy. Can I tell you something? We need mercy in our life. We need to cry out. Even though, you know, we might not have leprosy, but there's times in our life when we're sick, spiritually ill, we need to cry out and say, God, have mercy on me, God. God, heal me, Lord. God, here I am, Lord. Show mercy on me, Lord. God always shows mercy on his children. Amen? Here's the next thing. We learn to be more thankful when we stop to see the fact that what we need, we can't provide for ourselves. Come on. See, you can't save yourself. 
The things that we need in life, the things that God provides for you and I, we need to stop and look at the fact that we can't do it alone. We can't do it on our own. We need Jesus Christ on every level of our life. See, what I learned is a couple of things here. I wrote down some notes here. And one of the things I, I was thinking about was when we stop giving thanks and we stop praising God, then we really forget about who God is. Come on, somebody. We begin to forget about the things we God done for us. We start wandering away from God. See, when we stop worshiping and stop giving thanks to God, all of a sudden we start wandering away from God. We start going into a different direction. And when we find ourselves going away from God and stop giving God thanks about the things in our life and we start wandering away from God, then we fall into a depression. Come on. We fall into a depression. We get really depressed. That's why the Bible talks about be not dismayed. Be encouraged, because we need to be encouraged the fact that God still loves us. And the way that we encourage the way God still loves us is the fact that we recognize that God did everything and we didn't do anything. Without God, we're nothing. But with God, nothing is impossible. That's the God that we serve. That's the one that we should stop on a, on a daily basis. Look, we give thanks and we take a week off during the year. And some of you go hunting and some of you different things, you know, go see family. And Julie and I are going out of town having a little vacation. You know, that's wonderful. That's a great time of the year to do stuff like that. But you know what? We need to give thanks on a daily basis. We need to fall on our face on a daily basis and say, God, thank you this day for our daily bread. God, thank you for delivering me. God, thank you for saving me. God, thank you for just being there for me. Because God, without you, I can't do anything. Now, here's the next thing here. Is I, I want to really learn to give thanks. Because when we learn the fact that without giving thanks, we really grieve the heart of God. We begin to grieve the Father. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because look what he said here. Do you remember what he said? And, and I just, I don't know, sometimes when I read the scriptures, I just imagine the tone of voice or kind of imagine really how he's saying this because Jesus says a few things here and he asks us a few questions. Now, Jesus, when Jesus asks a question, let me just share this with you. Jesus knows all things. Come on. He already knows the answer. And many times when he's asking questions, he's trying to ask a question so you see it for yourself. So you can recognize it for yourself. So Jesus simply asks us a question here, and he's looking at it, he says what he says here. And Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleanse? Were there not ten cleanse? And then he goes on to say, but where are the nine? He realizes, he knows that leprosy is a death sentence. He knows that, listen, unless he came along and had mercy and healed these ones with leprosy, their life was never going to be the same. But all of a sudden now he's saying, what, wasn't there ten of you guys? What, what, what happened to the nine? What, what happened? Where did everybody go? And then he says something really interesting here. He says, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner, which is really unusual for them to do that? Now what I did, I, I wrote some things down here, and what I... I put in my notes here is maybe we can relate to some of these things. Maybe we can look at some of these reasons. And so since there was nine of them that didn't go back, and since there was nine of them that did not give thanks to the Father, I wrote down nine different excuses, nine reasons perhaps why they didn't go back. And for whatever reason, if you relate to one of these, I would tell you to stand up and say, here I am, Lord, but I don't think you would. Amen? But nine reasons why they did not return to give thanks. Here's the first one. Maybe one of them wanted to wait to see if the cure was real. Maybe they wanted to see if it, they were going to really stay healed or not, if it was really healed. And really, the next one's kind of in the same lines. Maybe one of them wanted to wait and see if it would last. Well, I tell you what, I, I remember when I got saved, and I really relate salvation to a miracle in my life because of where I come from and where I was living and the things I was doing during this time in my life. And I can remember a lot of people saying, it'll never last. He, he just, the truth was, they thought I would just got saved and had some form of religion because I was trying to get the girl. Amen? Which was true <laughs> for a small part. Amen? But you know what? Thank God it lasted all these years. Thank God I can look back after 35 years and say, hey, 
Still lasting. Amen? Still going strong. Here's the next one. Maybe one thought he really never had leprosy. Don't really need it. Not really sick. Never was. Maybe I really don't have leprosy. Maybe I'm really not lost. Maybe I really don't need to be saved. Maybe one of them said, he would just see Jesus later. Well, I just, I, I see him later. He'll be there later. God bless you. God bless you. One more time. God bless you. <laughs> but you know, maybe Jesus just, I mean, maybe he's thought, you know what, I'll see him later. Don't it sound like us, we'll put it off to tomorrow? Well, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll give thanks tomorrow. Maybe one of them thought he would have gotten well anyway. You know, I, maybe I just, I don't need to go back and give thanks. I would have got well anyway. Maybe one of them one gave all the priests all the glory. Now, to me, that sounds religious. Amen? Because they wanted to go back to the priest and give the priests all the glory. You know, when somebody... I ask a question, and I'll say something like, hey, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? When somebody tells me, well, well I'm a Baptist. Well, 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 I'm a Pentecost. Well, I'm a this, I'm a that, or whatever. And that's not what I ask you. You're saved. See, just because you go to church don't give you salvation. And see, this is a religious spirit here, because you're going back and giving all the glory to the religious spirit. You're going back and give all the glory to the priests. It ain't about the priests. See, I even love it today, even when I've been pastoring here for 20 years and somebody says, well, you must be really religious. I go, no, I'm not really not. Well, what do you mean? I said, no, I'm not religious. I have a relationship. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, I understand it's not about religion. I understand it's not about some man. I understand it's not about some building. It's about the Father. And his name is Jesus. And without him, we're nothing. Maybe one of them thought Jesus really didn't do anything. Wait, wait, what did he do? He just told us to go to the priest. I mean, really, what did, he, what did he really do? Huh? Don't that sound like a really good excuse? Maybe one of them thought any old rabbi could have done that. Any old rabbi, I mean, any rabbi could have done that. Or maybe one of them thought I was already much improved. I was already on the, on the, on the healing process. I was already feeling better. I was getting much better now. Amen? Charles Spurgeon said something I thought was kind of interesting. He saw a lady, and a lady said, If Jesus ever saved me, you would never hear the end of that. And I thought, you know what? That's how we ought to be. Listen, I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to hear the end of that. I don't ever want to stop talking about what Jesus has done for me. I don't ever want to stop and forget about where he took me from and where he's taken me to. We should all have the, 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 the place in our life where we say, you know what, when God does something in our life by the word of our testimony, I'm not going to stop talking about that. Yeah. I'm not going to quit telling people about that. Yeah. King David writes in, over in Psalms 107, and I want to read some of this to you. He's talking about Thanksgiving here, and he's talking about, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's us. Yeah. Amen who he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I don't know about you, but thank God he's taken me from the enemy's hand. Amen? Another place here, he says, And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to the city for dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. See, God... Listen, when we search after goodness and we search after righteousness and we search after, we thirst and hunger for these things, God is always willing to fill us and supply all that we need according to his riches and glory. Amen? We need to be thankful for the things of God. We're so quick, so judgmental to the point where we're just not really thankful. We, we maybe even take some things for granted. I, I, I heard a story, and I thought it was kind of interesting. The guy was telling his story, and he was talking about, he saw this guy, and he looked at him. He looked really just down and out, and really sad and depressed. And so he said, man, what's up, man? You, you look depressed. You look like you just don't feel good. And he goes, man, he says, a couple weeks ago, my grandmother died. Didn't even really know her, but she died and left me $80 million. It's like, whoa. Well, he said, the week after that, I had an uncle. Didn't even know him either. He left me $50 million. <laughs> Whoa. 
And then I had a, I had a cousin last week, believe me, 20 men. I didn't even know him either. Why in the world are you so depressed? Why do you look so sad? He said, nobody died this week. <laughs> we forget about it, amen? <laughs> Man, I started thinking, what I could do with that money? Anyway, that's another story, amen? But I want to just take just a quick second, and I know that gumbo is smelling good, and we're going to get out of here shortly because I can hear that potato salad calling my name. No onions, Bobby, no onions. But let us be an example of, of a real good giver. And, and really one of the places it talks about being a good giver is 2 Corinthians 9, 6. It's talking about being a cheerful giver, a happy giver. But this I say, he who sows spiritually will also reap spiritually. In other words, if you sow a little, you'll reap a little. But it goes and say, he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. In other words, much for much. And so let each one give as he purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to be cheerful about what we do. Amen. I say this all the time because it's a, it's a fact that we need to really look at. You know, it's exciting when, when we get, but it's more exciting that we're in a position to give. Yes. Amen? Isn't it good to be a giver? Isn't it good to be excited about what God... I want to always give God all the honor and glory and praise for everything that I always do. Now, what I did here is I, I really want to give you some examples of what I think a real, real giver, a giver of thanks really looks like. I want to give you some examples of what I think a real giver of thanks really, truly looks like. Here's the first one. A real giver of thanks is one who, when asked to do something, he will go the extra mile. He will go further than he's asked to go. See, a person that's really given thanks and a giver of thanks, he don't do just what he has to do. He goes a little bit further. We call that lamb yap. Come on, somebody. A little bit extra, a little bit more. There's a great story because... Actually, it was bound as a, as a, a deed or, or, or a creed or whatever you want to call it during this time. If a soldier was walking down the road and the soldier was carrying a bag and the soldier was tired of carrying his bag and if he asked you to carry his bag, by law, you're supposed to carry it for a mile. But he said, you know what? Go the extra mile. Carry it two miles. Maybe the law will tell you to carry it one mile, but a real faithful giver of the Lord or a real faithful person that understands with being a thankful giver is somebody that don't go just one mile, but goes two miles. I even read this scripture to you so you see it for yourself. Matthew 5, 41. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who ask, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you. Do not turn him away. Here's another one here. A real giver of thanks of faith. In other words, he's with skin on. I want to be somebody that don't have to tell somebody that I'm a thankful giver. They see it for themselves. I want to be an imitator of the things of God. We talk about it all the time, and I, and I said this kind of in a joking way, but you know, we say, you know, don't look at me, look at God, but we talk about how Paul simply said, follow me as I follow Christ. And see, as an imitator of as a good giver of God and a person that's imitating the things of God and being Jesus with skin on, people see it and they follow what they see. See, we need to be that example, just the example we are for our children. We need to be an example for the people that God puts in our life, puts around us. Amen? Here's another thing. A real giver of thanks sees life as a vapor and don't waste what he can do today to put off tomorrow. See, James says this in one place, 413. Come now, you say today or tomorrow we'll go and do such such city, spend a year there, buy, sell, and make a profit. He says, wherever you do not know what will happen tomorrow. This is what he said. For what is life? He's asking the question. What is life? It is even a vapor, vapor that it appears for a little time and then vanishes away? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Why did you put that in there, Pastor? Why were you talking about life is just a vapor? Because, see, if we're not careful, we'll be just like that other, one of the ones that said, you know what, I'll see Jesus later. Yeah. We'll constantly put it off to the point where, you know what, we could lose a soul. Come on. Have you ever, ever put off something to the point that maybe go and see somebody, say, man, I wish I wouldn't saw this person, and, and all of a sudden you, this person dies or something happens? And you think to yourself, man, I wish I'd have just took the time to go see them. You see, if we're not careful, we live in such a busy society. You know, we live in a microwave society. We want it, we want it now. 
Everything is now. Want it now. Give it to me now. And we don't have time to go do anything else. Listen, we can be too busy. Come on, somebody. We find ourselves in a place where we have to wake up and realize life is too short. We need to do what's right now. Listen, don't keep putting off saying, well, I'm going to spend time with my kids tomorrow. And all of a sudden one day, you know, I remember the song, you know, Cats in a Cradle and a Silver Spoon, Little Boy Blue and the Man in the Moon. Daddy, when you're coming home, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. Man, I remember working real hard and not being at home and hearing that song and go, <laughs> start crying, man. Why? Because that's not what I really wanted to be. You know, my father, who I love my dad, and I talk about my dad. My dad was a great provider, and he loved me as a son. But I remember I had graduated high school, and I had bought him a gift. And the gift I bought my father was he had to, he left school when he was in the 10th grade, and he went into the military, and he graduated. He got his GED, but he never got a chance to graduate from high school. And so I wanted to do something really special for him, and I bought him a graduation ring. I went back to the year he would have graduated. I found the the, the he graduated from, and I, I went and bought him a graduation ring. And I remember giving it to him. And I remember handing it to him, and he opened it up. And he didn't say nothing, but I knew what he was thinking. He opened it up, and he looked at me, and, and in his eyes, I could just see what he was thinking. He was thinking, man, where did the time go? Well, who, who's this young man that's standing before me? Is he the same young boy that was born just a few years ago? Why? Because we put off, listen, I'm telling you today, don't waste. Don't waste. Listen, life is but a vapor. Do what God's called you to do today. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Don't waste time. You know, one of the things I get a chance to do, and, and, and as one of the, the privilege I have as a pastor is, you know, I set my schedule, and I mean, I set my appointments. But you know what I set it around a lot of times? Well, my grandkids say, hey, Pop, I'm having something at school today. Or, Pop, I'm, I'm, I got... Thanksgiving lunch today. Papa, would you come spend lunch? And you know what I do? I go. I go. Why? Because I know that time's going to be gone before I even know it. Man, I'm so sad. And I, and, and, and I was just thinking about this past week when, when both of my granddaughters asked me to go. And I went one day for one and the next day for the other. And it was a young boy that was sitting at the table with us. And I remember just talking to him, and, and my granddaughter said to me, she said, said, Papa, you know somebody he knows and something she said. And, and so he just looks at me, and he says, yeah, he said, I was in foster care for the last couple of years. He said, my daddy beat me. And he said, they took me out of my daddy's home because my daddy wasn't quite right. And, but he's doing better now, and I'm back at home. And and I looked over at Nevaeh, and I could hear Nevaeh listen to the story, and she hears it all the time because there was story on top of story on top of story on top of story about situations like that. And I just looked at Nevaeh, and I just said, man, don't you see how blessed you are to have your family? You know? Because here's this poor kid. He just, I mean, he wouldn't stop talking to me. You know why? I didn't mind at all because I wanted to be Jesus with skin onto this young man. The same thing with us in life. Don't put off. Don't just do it now, man. Don't wait till tomorrow. I could stay on that one for a long time because I think that's one that most of us, we're not careful, we're all guilty of. Amen? Amen. Here's another one here. A real giver of thanks is quick to edify, not to destroy. Even Corinthians says this. He says, for even if I should boast somewhat about our authority, which the Lord gave us, which, what he gave us for, he said, for edification and not for destruction, I shall not be ashamed. You see... All of us should be edifiers, not destroyers. Why? Because the world does enough for us. Does enough for us. The world does enough destruction to the world, to, to men and women today like never before. You see, a person that understands who he is and where he's coming from is not somebody that has to destroy somebody to make themselves look better. It's somebody who is, is ready to edify that person and, and to lift that person up and just be kind and nice to someone. Look, there are people out there today that are just looking for a nice, kind word. Be a giver of thanks by saying, you know what? I know who I am. I know what God's done for me. And I just want to help somebody else get along the same way that I got along. Somebody's come alongside of me and spoke life into me. There's so many of them out there that just blows your mind. That Just looking for a kind word. Looking for somebody to just say something nice. And if you're a giver of thanks, you learn what the Scripture says. Because see... Here's what we do. We get to the point where we think we're all that. 
And then all of a sudden, we start degrading somebody because they're not at the level we're at. Shame on us, man. Shame on us. We should be those people that want people to get along and, 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 and get them to where you're at. You know, when somebody tells me, and, I, and, and forgive me for saying this if I'm stepping on somebody else's toes, but when somebody says to me, you know, my kids have to learn. They got to learn for themselves. They got to start on their own and all that stuff. You know what? That's not what I want my kids to do. I want my kids to be an extension of who I am. I want them to go further than I ever went before. They don't have to go back here. They don't have to start where I started. Guess what? If I had the opportunity to help with my kids, I'm going to help them. And guess what? I'm going to help anybody that God puts in my path to edify them to a point where they can grow further than I can go. Because, see, that's when you know who you are. You don't have to belittle them so you make yourself feel like you're bigger than they are. There are people even in management today that manage with, with destruction instead of edification. It belittle them to make them feel like they don't belong anywhere else or nobody else would ever have them. You're just lucky to be here. That's what they make you feel like. And really the last one kind of still goes along with some of the other things I talked about. A real giver of thanks rejoices both in the sowing and the reaping. John said this in 436. And he goes on saying, he who reaps re receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both who sows and who reaps may rejoice together. Now why did you put that one in there, Pastor? Because, look, for me personally, I love to give. And one of the hardest things I had to learn was to receive, whether you believe that or not. I mean, if you're a giver, you've been a giver all your life, it's harder to, to, to have to, to somebody want to give you something. It's almost like, no, no, I don't, no, don't give it to me. But you know what you do? If you're not careful, you take away their blessings. And so, you know what, why we don't do it? Here's why we don't receive. You ready? I won't even look at you. I'll look over here. Amen. It becomes prideful. It becomes a prideful thing in our life. I remember the day that Julie and I began to sell. Everything wasn't tied down. We looked like the Beverly Hillbillies. Had everything loaded up, grandmother in a rocking chair on top. I mean, we were loaded up, amen. We was going off to seminary. And a guy that I grew up with, he was older than I was, but he was actually one of my coaches when I was in Junior Olympics. He said, you're going into ministry, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he reached in his pocket and he gave me something. And I, I opened it later, and it was a $100 bill. And I'm not going to lie to you, man. I cried like a baby. Yeah. I mean, it was like, just I wept because I was like, oh, God, I'm so unworthy. Yeah. You know what? God wants to bless us. And so if you're going to understand who you are as a giver, guess what? When you sow, expect to receive the reward. Yeah. Amen? God wants to bless his children. God, God's word is what his word is. He can't deny that. God loves us, and God wants to give us, and we need to be thankful for where God has taken us from. I uh, was pondering through some things and trying to really come up with a story or read a story that I could really grab a hold of understanding what a real giver or understanding being a thankful giver. And I was quickly reminded of my time that we lived in Russia. We lived in Russia, and there was a family that was in our church, and the Russian names, a lot of the Russian names were hard to remember, so we, we'd call them American names to remember. And this guy, we called him MacGyver. I mean, he could fix anything. He had a toothpick and a shoestring. He could build a car. Amen. This guy could just fix anything. And his wife, we called her Rambo because she would get it done. Amen. But I remember they invited us to their house, and they told us where they lived at, and where they lived at was an abandoned prison. They lived in an old abandoned prison. And every day, he would have to climb the electrical pole to hook up the electricity because they'd come during the day, or he'd climb at night and hook it back up because they'd come in the day and they'd turn it off. And we went to this place where it was, and it was really dark and dingy, and we'd get to his room, and for those who understand of ever being overseas, you know, everything's 220, electrical 220. In the corner of this room, he had a piece of lead pipe wrapped with wire around it, plugged into the wall. You can hear it, whoa, because <laughs> it was heating up the room through this power. Of course, you know, there was, you know, you had to watch your kids from touching it. What's that? You know, no, don't touch that, because they were little. They were young. But I remember being at these people's house, and, and, and they were so thankful that we came, and so they served us some tea, and we drank some tea, and we fellowship with them and stuff. And you got to understand, when you're in Russia, you don't sit down for just a minute. You're there for a while. Yeah. You know, they can get in a hurry. 
And I'm, they said, can you please come back another time? We'd like to, to, to have supper for you one night. So we said, okay. And, but while the kids were playing, they went in their room and they got these little rabbits. Ingor? Angor rabbits. They had these little rabbits and they let the kids play with the rabbits. And they were playing with the rabbits and, you know, Kobe and Caleb and Kylie were young. And they were playing with the rabbits and stuff. And so they invited us to come back. And so we go back another time and we're sitting there and... Man, we're having a meal, and they served us a soup, and we're eating the soup, and I think it was Kobe said, hey, can we play with the rabbits? And they're like, it's in the soup. <laughs> Bro, they gave us their best. They were thankful. You know what? That humbles you. Yeah. The same lady, man, she, she was part of the leadership, and I was trying to really stretch our leaders, and we were all going on this trip, and I was trying to get them to come up or whatever they could come up to take this trip. It was like a week trip. And I was like, whatever you can come up with, I'll, I'll get the rest. I'll make sure you can make this trip. And, and so they were all coming up with different kind of money. And I remember we got on the train, and my wife and I was in our coupe, and my interpreter was there, and I was trying to make sure that she had enough money. So she comes to my room, and our, our coupe, and she comes in there, and she's so excited. She's like, oh, God bless me. God bless me so much. And I mean, she's just crying. God really blessed me so I could come on this trip. And so I said, well, how much you got? She said, oh, I got 100,000 rubles. That was like 20 bucks, like a month's salary for, uh, during that time. And so I said, okay, I'll make sure you have the rest. And man, I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, how did you get the 100,000 rubles? You're talking about how God blessed you. And she says, oh, she said, I was able to sell my clothes in the marketplace. Come on. It'll humble you, man. But you know what? God honored that. That same lady, man, it wasn't, what, G, a month later, two months later? I'm preaching in a service, and she was praying for her husband and praying for her son and praying for her father. And I'm preaching on a Sunday morning, and I'm in the middle of my message, and this two guys come walking to the front of the stage and stood there, and I looked at my interpreter. I'm like, what do they want? And so we asked them, you know. I thought they were mafia taking me out. I said, I didn't know what they wanted, you know. And so they looked up at me, and they said, listen, we came to get saved, but now we've got to go to work. Can we get saved before we go? And I led both of them in a, in a sinner's prayer right there. It wasn't but a month later, her daddy got saved. Listen, I'm telling you, God honored, God honored it. When she was willing to sacrifice something she loved as her clothes and her animals, listen, that's what you do to understand being a good giver, amen? Because God always gives back and blesses. God will not deny himself. If we learn to be a good giver, and listen, guys, I'm not fixing to pick up an offering, so don't get freaked out, you know. But I'm telling you, spiritually speaking, let's be givers of the kingdom. Yes. Let's give of ourselves to our neighbors. Maybe there's somebody that you know this week that won't have Thanksgiving. By the way, we have on Tuesday at between 10, 10 and 2 o'clock, we're giving away turkeys here. And so if you know somebody that don't have uh, a turkey, tell them to come here. If they, don't know, if they can't come, you bring them here. Amen. But we'll have turkeys, and we even have some groceries to give away. And so from, from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, we'll be doing that here. Brother Kelvin is in charge of that. Let's be givers. Let's be a thankful giver. Amen? Giver of thanks. Father, I thank you so much for this day and this time. And God, my prayer today is that you just begin to touch the hearts of every man, woman, and child in this place. God, I don't know how you have ministered to different people for different reasons, God. But whatever was said today, God, I pray that it touch their lives. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I'm not here to embarrass you or call you out. Just want to pray for you. But you're here today, and maybe something in the message today, and I don't need to go back and go through all of it, but maybe something in the message today really spoke to you and really touched you. And it's an area of your life that you say, Pastor, would you pray for me in that area of my life? Don't need to know what it is. But you would simply say, Pastor, come in agreement with me and pray for me for this area of my life. I need prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you this morning, just slip up your hand, put it up, put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you that we could come and we can be so thankful for what you've done for us. 
And God, I pray today, God, I don't know the circumstances, don't know what the Holy Spirit is speaking into the lives of people all over this sanctuary. But Father, whatever it is, God, I come alongside of them and I mix my faith with their faith and I ask you to just begin to give them the wisdom, give them the strength, give them the capabilities to do what you call them to do. God, whatever you're trying to show them, God, whatever they need, you're God that supplies all our needs. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you came this morning. And maybe you showed up and you said, Pastor, I'm lost in need of a Savior. Or maybe you showed up and you said, Pastor, I'm backslidden. Either way, right there between you and God, from the heart. Let's get this right this morning. From the heart, just begin to pray. Just simply say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. Jesus, forgive me where I failed you. Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart and save me. Jesus, I want to make you my Lord and my Savior, my Master and my King. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you prayed that prayer this morning for the first time, or maybe it's a prayer rededication. It doesn't matter. I just want to pray with you. If that's you this morning, right where you're at, just raise your hand. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. God, I pray today for every hand that was lifted. God, I pray that another believer will come alongside of them, encourage them, be there for them. God, I pray you get them plugged in to a good fellowship. God, if this is where you want them to be, then let them get plugged in. If not, God, you bring them where they need to be. Show yourself real in their hearts and in their lives as we honor you with all that we say and do. We thank you for saving our soul. We thank you for redeeming us. Blessings be upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.